In this video, we're gonna cover N64 emulation on M1 and M2 based Macs. Thanks to the newest versions of RetroArch, Max can finally take advantage of awesome N64 emulation using the Moopin 64 Plus Next Core and its parallel RDP and RSP. This gives you such a great level of accuracy and authenticity to the N64 experience that it's just awesome to finally see it available on Mac proper. So let's just go ahead and dive in. Now the first thing we're going to need before we get started is RetroArch set up and installed on your M1 or M2 based Mac. If you haven't done so already, link will be in the description below to my Mac RetroArch setup guide. So follow along with that, get everything set up and good to go, and then continue along with this guide. Now our only prerequisite needed for N64 games, we're not talking about disk drive stuff in this video, just cartridge based N64 games. So you're only going to need N64 ROMs and they can be in a variety of formats. There's Z64, N64, bin, or you can zip them up. Now you will need to supply these game files yourself. No links will be provided on my channel to illegal downloads. If you happen to have a large physical selection of N64 games, you can use something like the Retro Blaster Programmer to dump them. I have a guide on the channel on how to do this if you're interested, but it does require you to have a PC as well as the Retro Blaster Programmer. So this would work in a separate partition on a Mac or in a virtual environment as well. So do be aware of that. Otherwise you can resort to Google to find them as well. But once again, no illegal download links on my channel. Requests for such things will be deleted. But once you have your game sourced, just go ahead and store them wherever you want on your Mac. I have mine inside an external drive named emulation under a games folder. It makes it nice and easy for me to find them. But once you have your games placed, just go ahead and boot up into RetroArch. Now from here, head into the online updater, core downloader, and you can press right on your keyboard or on a D-pad with a controller and scroll down to the Nintendo section here and find the Nintendo 64 Boopin 64 Plus Next Core, and then just press enter to download it. Perfect. Now from here, we're going to make a games playlist so that way we can more easily access our N64 games. So head down to import content, click on scan directory, click on the slash there, press up on your keyboard to go to volumes, Navigate to where you have your game stored. So again, I have mine in an external drive named emulation under games and in a folder named N64 games. So it makes it super easy to find them. But once you get to the directory where your games are stored, just select scan this directory and it will scan all of the games that you have in that directory. If you get a notification about no proper content or anything like that, you will need to go in and do a manual scan. And the process for that is pretty straightforward as well. You just click on manual scan, choose your content directory, choose your system name, you can choose a default core, and then you'd make sure that scan inside archives is turned on. And then you'd run your scan right there. But once completed, you'll be greeted with a new N64 playlist entry here. And if your Groms are named correctly, RetroArch will probably automatically download thumbnails for all of your entries. Now, if for whatever reason one of your games doesn't populate with a box art, you could just do like a Google search for it and then just find one that's in JPEG format. So I'm just going to grab this one here. I'm going to save the image, give it a placeholder name of 40 winks right there. And I'm just going to put it on my desktop so I can find it more easily. There we go. Now to add this to our RetroArch playlist. Now inside our finder, we're gonna click on the go button here and then hold the alt option key, whichever one it is uh, that has this type of a symbol. And you'll see a folder pop up that says library. So we're gonna go into the library folder here, application support. We're gonna find our RetroArch folder and inside is a thumbnails folder. Now we're going to go to Nintendo 64, named Box Arts, and we're going to go ahead and add in the box art for the game in question. Now the thing to note about this is it needs to be named after the game as it appears in the playlist. So just going to unfull screen RetroArch here real quick. Go to my Nintendo 64 playlist. So here we go. We'll move this over here so that way we can more easily rename that box art. So it is named 
40 winks. USA. Proto. 2000. Dash zero one dash one zero. There we go. So now that, that has been named and put into the named box arts folder, if I go back into my playlist here, might need to restart RetroArch for it to take effect actually. So minor correction to myself here, it needs to be in .png format on Mac. So you could just click on open with and then do the preview window here. And then you could just save it And then you can just save it as a PNG format picture and you can tell it where to save it at. So I'm just going to have it saved to the desktop again in PNG format. There we go. And then from here is where you would put it into the thumbnail folder and then name it after the game in question as it appears in the playlist. So there we go. And then when you select it in the playlist, it will now have its box art. But from here, you could get a controller hooked up to your Mac, and then you could just go through, select a game, and then tell it to run, and then choose the core of choice. But there we go, N64 games up and running on an M2 Mac Mini. So that'll give you the basics of running N64 games on your Macs. But this being RetroArch and emulation, there's so much more we can do with it. And one of the things that we want to do is change over to the parallel RDP and RSP for the best visual and audio experience for N64 emulation. So from within your N64 game, just press the guide button on your controller or F1 on a keyboard and navigate down to core options. And from here, we're gonna change the RDP plugin from Glide to Parallel, and the RSP plugin over to Parallel as well. And after we have those options set, we're just gonna go ahead and close out of the core and restart our content to have the change take effect. So just closing out of that real quick. Now, unfortunately, the Mac version of RetroArch has a nasty habit of not letting you run two N64 games in a row, at least not for me anyway. So I actually just have to close out of it all the way real quick and then load it back up for you to be able to load N64 games again. So there we go. And there we go. Now we are running N64 emulation using the parallel RDP and RSP, and it already looks so much better, even on native resolution default settings. Like it just looks so much, so much cleaner, more authentic. But anyway, going back into our core options here, we have a new parallel RDP subcategory here that we can now change settings in now that we have the RDP selected as parallel. So we're gonna leave synchronous RDP alone, leave that one on. You can crop over scan around the edges of your screen if there happens to be garbage data anywhere. But now we have a number of VI filtering options that we can enable or disable. So again, this is what an N64 output mostly looks like, but you can change things to get rid of things like dithering, get rid of the anti-aliasing filter, get rid of the bilinear filter to sharpen up those pixels, and basically turning it into like an N64 digital HDMI mod where you could just unblur the image. So personal preference on what you think looks good. I'm used to N64 blur, so I typically tend to leave all this stuff on. And in emulation, it's not as blurry as it is on actual hardware anyway, so it just looks nice. But next we have our upscaling factor, and this one will require a content restart to take effect. So we have one, two, four, and eight times options available. Eight times is not going to work on most machines. Like it requires some of the beefiest video cards to get this to run without lagging. 
so the safer options are to use 2 and 4. So one of the best ways to determine if your Mac is going to be able to run content at a higher resolution is to use games like Star Wars Rogue Squadron or Battle for Naboo. So I'm going to set this to 4x real quick. Close out of my content. Going to restart RetroArch. And now I am going to load up Episode 1 Battle for Naboo because it is just one of the most demanding games on N64 emulation. And that is a promising start. Very good. Oh, nope. And we have lost full speed. All right. So that might be because of our upresing, and it might be because the game is too demanding for M2, uh, for the M2 processor. So gonna check this by changing this up to a 2x upres. Close out of the content, restart RetroArch, and then load it back up. And we'll see if we get full speed at that same spot. And there we go. So it looks like the base M2 Mac Mini GPU is just not strong enough to run parallel at four times up resing in this demanding of a title. Lighter weight games like Super Mario 64 would probably run perfectly, but... I'm going to stick with a 2x upresing just to ensure compatibility and less of a headache in trying to manually set things up per game. But going back into core options and the parallel RDP options here, so on an M2 Mac Mini, base M2 Mac Mini, that 2x is my hard limit that I'm going to want to run with. So our next option is to enable super sampling for frame buffer effects. So these are things like the screen in Mario Kart 64 or other frame buffer emulation effects. You can have those super sample to increase their appearance, but it could lead to graphical errors. So typically I don't tend to use it, but personal preference, if you want to enable it, it can lead to a much nicer looking experience. And then you could choose to have those frame buffer effects dithered. So personal preference on if you want to have that on or off as well. Next up, downsampling factor. So this will let you downsample your upscaled image to have a higher internal resolution, but kind of preserve that lower res look of N64 games. So I'm not really the biggest fan of this. I don't think it personally looks that great in most use cases, but it can look really good on an actual CRT or with good CRT shaders, I suppose. So personal preference on if you want to use that or not. And next up we have native texture level of detail. So this will change the native level of detail on your upscaling. So in GoldenEye here, it's the best example I can give. You can see how in the mid-ground about here-ish, it looks a little bit clearer without this option turned on. So if you want to go back to native detail levels, you can see that it is now more blurry right here in the mid-ground. So if you want things to appear a bit more high res, leave this option off. You want it to be a little bit more authentic, you can turn it on. Next, native resolution text rec, leave that one on. It fixes problems with border seams, so very good to have that one. And our next option is for deinterlacing. So a lot of N64 games ran in 480i in-game and in menus. So episode one, Battle for Naboo being an example, you saw how the screen was shaking when it was loading up. That is because of Bob deinterlacing. If you don't want to have that shaking effect, you could turn this over to Weave and just deal with some combing on different objects as they move. It's a personal preference thing, but I think Weave is typically the better choice for most cases because Bob can get a little uh, headache inducing after a while. But moving on. Next up, CPU core, leave that alone. RSP plugin, we just changed that to parallel. Next, we have frame duplication. This helps smooth out the appearance of some N64 games, so I like to turn this one on. Next up, frame rate. So this is set to original by default and will mimic original N64 hardware. So all hardware-based lag and things like that will be attempted to be emulated accurately. 
N64 emulation is still faster than original hardware, so even with this set to original, you are getting better performance than in most real N64 games. But you could change this option to full speed to basically enable a manual overclock of the N64 hardware to get faster frame rates out of your games. And then same thing with the VI refresh, this is another overclocking option. So you can enable this to further smooth out your frame rate performance in a lot of titles. Do note that both of these options can break some stuff, so use with caution. Our next option is to disable the expansion pack. So Moopin64 Plus Next enables an expansion pack by default. So if you want to run a game without it, you can turn this option on. Do know that games that require the expansion pack like Donkey Kong 64, Majora's Mask will not run if this option is turned on. But it's cool to mess around with and see how games would behave without the expansion pack. So pretty fun to mess with. Next up, ignore emulated TLB exceptions. So this option really doesn't need to be used unless you are running certain ROM hacks. So if you're using a ROM hack and it doesn't work, you could try turning on one of these TLB exceptions. But for standard N64 games, this should not be needed. We're gonna skip over count per op and count per op divider. We can overclock the system using the frame rate and VI refresh already. And frame rate already kind of changes this a little bit on its own. So moving on to pack and controller options. So heading in here, you could change the analog dead zone for your controller as well as the sensitivity. So definitely worth fine tuning this in here to get the best possible controller experience. So on my dual sense, I typically set the dead zone to zero and analog sensitivity up to about 110%. Then you can adjust C button mappings if needed, but moving down to player one pack, this is where you choose between your N64 memory or rumble pack as necessary. So switching this over to Rumble, I now have Rumble support in GoldenEye. And it feels great. Now one of the last pack options you saw in there was for N64 transfer packs. So let's take a minute to show how to get that set up. And I'm gonna be using Pokemon Yellow version as my example here. So I have right here a fully completed Pokemon Yellow save file that I'm going to add to my RetroArch saves folder to use for N64 transfer pack emulation. So to get to my RetroArch folder, I just need to click on documents inside the finder here, go into RetroArch, saves, and this is where all of RetroArch save files are stored. So I'm just gonna add in this 100% Pokemon Yellow save file, and I need to change the file extension to get it to work with the expansion pack. So RetroArch, defaults all of its Game Boy saves into an SRAM extension. So to fix this up for the expansion pack, we just need to change it from SRM to SAV. And when it gets mad at you about changing the extension, just tell it to use the new one. There we go. And another thing to note, the name of the save has to match the ROM file in use. So this is the same name that I have on my Pokemon Yellow ROM file that is located in my emulation folder, Game Boy Games, and Pokemon Yellow. So there it is, right there. But now that I have the save file in my saves folder, it has the same name as my ROM and the proper SAV save, we are ready to begin with transfer pack emulation. So heading into RetroArch. Gonna load up Pokemon Stadium here. And before the game finishes running, I'm just gonna go in here, go down to core options, pack controller options, player one pack, and I'm gonna turn this over to transfer pack. All right. So just need to close out of the content now to have that take effect and restart RetroArch because of that annoying bug that I'm currently experiencing. Anyway, so to properly emulate the transfer pack, we're gonna enter load core here on the main menu and we're gonna select Moopin64 Plus next. Now that that's loaded in, you'll see a new subsystems folder here. So just select that. And we are going to load up an N64 transfer pack. So the first thing it's asking for is that save file. So click on load N64 transfer pack, navigate to your RetroArch save directory. So that's under slash volumes, Macintosh HD, 
users, your username, documents. It's going to ask you for access, so click on OK. Go into RetroArch, go to your saves file, and in my case, I'm going to select the Pokemon Yellow version save file. Now, under subsystems, once again, it's going to ask you for the Game Boy ROM file, so just select load N64 transfer pack. Now we're going to navigate to where our games are stored. So I have mine on my emulation drive. Games. Game Boy Games. I'm going to select Pokemon Yellow. Now in subsystems, once again, we're going to load up our N64 cartridge. So load N64 transfer pack. This time I'm going to go to my N64 games folder. Select Pokemon Stadium 1 or 2. Doesn't matter. Either one should work. And finally, in subsystems, click on Start N64 Transfer Pack so you can see down underneath it that you have the Pokemon save file, the ROM, and the N64 game selected. Again, make sure the file names all match for the save file and the Game Boy game. But once set, just click on Start N64 Transfer Pack. And there we go. My transfer pack has loaded up. I can see my Pokemon Yellow save file right there. And going into Pokemon Stadium, I could go into the Battle Stadium here. I'm gonna head into the Prime Cup. Registration. Register Pokemon. And I'm gonna register the Pokemon from my Game Boy cart here. So here we go. And there we go. I just registered a team in emulation using a Pokemon Yellow ROM file. And save. And there we go, Pokemon Stadium being played to its fullest extent through emulation. Very cool stuff. Now it is worth noting that this transfer pack isn't 100% compatible, so you could do things in like the Pokemon Lab where you can move items and Pokemon around, organize boxes and different things like that. But it does not let you use the Game Boy Tower. When you try to go into the Game Boy Tower and load up your game, you're just going to be greeted by an air screen. And then the transfer pack emulation typically breaks. So you have to start the whole process over again from that point. So there we go. One of the limitations of current transfer pack emulation with Moopin64 Plus Next. Now, one of the last things I want to cover here in this video is the use of shaders. So heading into your quick menu, you can scroll down here and find the shaders option. So you can enable video shaders by turning this option on. And then you just click on load, select shaders slang, and begin loading up any number of presets. Do make sure you have downloaded shaders from the online updater before trying, otherwise this will be empty. But when it comes to the use of shaders, I like to use a CRT shader for most of my emulation needs. And one of my favorite has always been CRT easy mode. It just gives you a really nice clean look, doesn't require a lot of setup, and it looks good on native resolution content and upscaled content. So it's just kind of a jack of all trades shader that's just gonna give you great, great results. But for a more specialized shader, you can look at things like, let's see here. There is the CRT Royal shader. That is also a good one. Gives you a more interesting composite video look. Another cool option is to head into the bezel folder and select the Mega Bezel presets. And there's a number of presets available for this one. So base CRT presets, you can grab an easy mode shader effect here. And these ones can take quite a while to implement because of how much they are freaking loading in. But this one is super cool because it actually gives you like this insane reflective glass look, self-reflecting image. But unfortunately, it might be a bit too demanding on an M2 Mac Mini GPU. It is a very demanding shader effect. So I can't use this one on my M2 Mac Mini, but who knows? Maybe you'll be able to use it on your more higher-end Mac Pros or something like that. 
definitely worth uh, checking it out at least because it does give such a cool effect. But once you've found a shader preset that you enjoy and you want to use on your N64 games, you can head back into the shader tab, click on the save button here, and you can save the shader preset as a core preset or a game preset. So we're just going to save it as a core preset. So that way, every time I load up an N64 game, this is the shader that will greet me. But that's going to do it for this one. As always, thank you so much for watching. And I hope that this helps you get your N64 emulation projects up and running on your M1 and M2 based Macs. But here at the end, I do have a couple of big favors to ask. If you haven't done so already, be sure to hit that like dislike button, depending on how much you like today's tutorial, as well as that sub button and notification bell so you can see when new videos go live on the channel. Loads of content coming your way, and I'd always love to have each and every one of you along for the ride. For anyone interested in further helping support the channel and keep this content coming, be sure to check out that join button here on YouTube or the Patreon link in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. A little goes a long way to keeping us going, and it means the world to have your support. Big shout out to all of our current backers. You're amazing. You're rock stars. You're champions. Like, just couldn't do it without you. Thank you for believing what we do here and helping us keep it going. But until next time, my wonderful internet peeps, you all stay awesome, keep on gaming, and we'll see you back next video.